The Consulting Success Podcast is powered by the Clarity Coaching Program. If you'd like to work directly with the Consulting Success team and receive personal coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to find out more and apply. Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky here and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have Lauren Sergi joining us. Lauren, welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so you are an author, a speaker, a trainer, a consultant in the area of speaking and communications. Your clients include organizations like KPMG, T-Mobile, Meeting Professions International, and many others. And your latest book, Unmute, teaches professionals how to master the art of virtual communications, which is something that we are all dealing with or need to learn to deal with if we haven't already, given the pandemic and COVID and everything that's been going on for the last couple of years here or so. But before we get into how consultants can leverage the power of communication speaking to improve their work and their business, I'd love to kind of get started with your background, like how you got to where you are, where did your love and passion for for speaking and communication come from? The love and passion for speaking and communication has been around for much longer than I've been doing this. I'll tell you that I have a background in acting, in radio, in performance. I loved giving and writing speeches even as a kid, but I had brutal performance anxiety. I terrified would cry in front of a room of people if they had to see me do something like, God forbid, play the piano or whatever, terrified. So I needed to learn how to get over that to do the love that I had for communication, which is, I think, why I'm able to help so many people do the same. But the business itself around the communication training and the public speaking and the consulting really came out of my brief career as the world's worst librarian in that I was never a terribly good fit for the library profession, which is an amazing profession. But what I was always asked to do was give presentations. If my bosses wanted someone to talk at a conference or to give training demonstrations or whatever, immediately they would call on me, probably because I already had kind of the background to do it. And when I was giving those presentations, usually about topics like what databases to use and how to sell these databases to library patrons that they would use them to, Invariably afterwards, the people who called me there or the conference organizers would come up and say, wow, that was awesome. Never thought I would actually be enthusiastic about these databases. Can you come back and teach us how to speak like that? And I said, yep, because I had systematized it at that point. I had an approach because I had to do so many. And my thought was, if they're asking for this, other people want it too. Mm. How long were you... Did you have that experience where people were asking you for help? Like, how long did it take for it to, to really click and then for you to, to decide to make the leap to b- start building a business around that? I started kind of flirting with it about a year before I took the leap and actually hung out my shingle. And it started off with me just testing out ideas at library conferences, thinking, okay, can I make this? Maybe I can create a niche within libraries just doing this. So I started testing topics and different presentations in different sessions at library conferences. And then when I switched jobs and I was working at a post-secondary institution and the same questions were coming at me, I thought, I wonder if I can find paying clients outside of this industry. And I stuck an ad in Kijiji, the, for the U Americans, it's the Canadian version of Craigslist. I put an ad in Kijiji and had my first one-on-one client two weeks later. Yeah. I want to dive into that in a lot more detail in just a moment. But before we do, I can't escape taking us back to the elephant in the room that I think probably resonated with so many people, which is you had to give presentations or you had this love and just kind of interest in presenting, in communicating, yet you had also this fear right? Terrified, petrified of, and all other kinds of words we could probably use to describe what was going on inside of you. Can you walk us through how you dealt with that? And I know that could could be a much longer session, but if you could boil it down, because probably today more than ever, and certainly for the last many years, I think this resonates with so many people because 
many of us resonate or understand that we need to communicate, whether it's on a podcast or on a YouTube video or doing a webinar. And so there's people out there, many people that have this expertise. They're very good at what they do. They have a lot of knowledge, but they're a little bit scared, if not very scared to get in front of other people and do that publicly for the fear of saying something wrong or something not working out. Can you walk us through in a little bit more detail how you specifically overcame that? Because not only did you overcome that to do more of that yourself, you got to the point where you mastered it so that you could actually teach others how to do it themselves too. And I know you work with many different business leaders and managers and all that kind of stuff. So kind of walk us through your specific kind of case, if you could. The first thing to realize is that being afraid or nervous to present is not a personal failing. It is a built-in, like amygdala, lizard brain, to use Seth Godin's term, response to being in front and singled out in front of a group of other people. That is an inherently anxiety-provoking thing for the vast majority of humans out there. Very, very primitive response. And it happens to people at every level, every single level. I've worked with CEOs who shake in their boots when they have to do this. So my own process for getting through it was first up realizing that people weren't actually testing me. It wasn't a test. And while they were judging me in a certain way, we can't get away from being judged. I had to recognize that they needed something from me and they knew that they needed that thing from me. So that's what they were really focused on. It was that. And having that in my head was a really important thing. I would focus on This is the thing that I have that they can't get from anyone else that they need from me and I want to give it to them. So kind of replacing the urge to withdraw with an equally intense drive to reach out and help. Many people who speak get into it because they love helping other people and that's how they get over the fear. The other thing that I did that was incredibly useful, especially when I realized, no, I want to do this really well, like as best as anyone possibly can. So I got used to being watched. And that, whether or not you're speaking in front of a live audience or to a camera, is one of those things that makes us freeze up because that, that again, is the, the amygdala. They're watching me. They're watching me. So I started small. If I was at a library conference, and this was very early into my library career when it's like, this could be a thing, I would always ask questions in every single session I sat in, but I wouldn't ask the question from my chair. I would stand up, say my name and where I was from, like name, rank, and serial number, pause, and then ask the question and stay standing while the person answered it. Because the second you stand up in a room, every eyeball is going to swivel to you. And that's a moment where you then have to be quiet and be still and allow yourself to be watched. So it's a really low stakes way of putting yourself out there and getting used to be the one who's under scrutiny. And then after that, it was, okay, I am going to do this at meetings. I am going to ask to give presentations at meetings. I will volunteer myself to give a report and I won't do it from my chair. I will move to the front of the room so that my brain learns to get over that, the long walk, as I like to call it, from your seat to the front of the room. So it's a lot of exposure that way. And then I became hyper-focused, like I said, on what it was I was there to do. What is my core message? Who are the people that I'm speaking to and what do they need? And the more I focused on that, the more I could pull myself out of my own fearful headspace and get used to it. And then you can drip in things like breathing techniques to slow down your heart rate and all of that kind of snowballs together into learning how to deal with that fear. But you have to get up and do it over and over and over again. How long did you find that it took you from recognizing that you had that fear to getting to a place where you feel like, yeah, I've conquered it, or I've made such significant progress that I can't even recognize the person that that I was before. Like, Were you getting up and walking to the front of the room or standing up in a conference and asking the question and remaining standing and still had that fear inside of you? Or when you were offering yourself to, to make those presentations or to lead a talk, were you already at a place where you had comfort? It was before I had comfort. I knew that being comfortable with making the offer and giving the talk would come as I got the experience doing it. You have to be willing to hear no in order to hear yes, a you know, common aspect of marketing. And I knew that I wouldn't get comfortable unless I heard a lot of yeses, which meant that I also had to hear a lot of no's 
in terms of offering myself out there. With that gradual shifting away from being in a fearful place, it actually happened pretty quickly, especially when I set up that deliberate practice of getting comfortable being watched. A few months, and I was no longer uncomfortable being watched by a group of people. The other big factor there was that I also knew that it had to be because I was being watched doing something that I felt a kind of mastery or self-possession or knowledge about. So if you do something that you're not certain of, that you're already hesitant or you don't have your message straight or it's not a medium that you're comfortable in or whatever, then it's going to take longer. You will be carrying that lack of topic mastery into your speaking. So discovering what topics I was comfortable with was a big one. And I quickly recognized, hey, wait a minute. When I talk about this kind of thing, that lizard brain is really, really loud. When I talk about this thing, I am so in it that it isn't even a factor. Yeah, I'm a little jittery. I'm a little nervous. But the bigger urge to help people and share the info, that's what's taking up all of the mental space. So you want to recognize what topics light you up and then focus on speaking about that sort of thing. Interestingly enough, though, with the urge, with that fear of being seen, I firmly believe that you can cross train in terms of getting used to being watched. So I have had clients to whom I've recommended things like dance lessons, because the whole point of dancing is that someone is watching you, but it's low stakes, right? It doesn't matter. You don't have to say anything. You just have to participate in your recital, no matter how ridiculous you feel and be watched. Same thing with improvisation classes. You get used to being watched while taking a risk with your words in front of other people, but there's no stakes. There's no limitation there. So you can find ways outside of your domain in order to practice these skills. Is there any other key that can help people unlock this fear? And I'm thinking about from a marketing perspective, oftentimes people will be hesitant to go out and market themselves or to talk about what they're doing, just even contacting people, right? Because they're concerned about being too salesy or or promotional. And we found and worked with many clients that one of the keys to help kind of unlock that hesitation around marketing or doing outreach or follow-up is shifting the focus from marketing being something that you're doing for yourself, right? So it's with my self-interest, I want to market, I want to sell, to instead shifting the focus to those that you actually want to, to help, right? And so there's a responsibility that if you have expertise and there's somebody out there that has a problem, that if you're not letting those people know that you exist and doing it in a way that can help them and provide value to them, it's actually a disservice to them. So that's kind of one key. The other key that we found is asking the question of why are you doing this? So we had one client who I've talked about on the podcast other times who had a lot of hesitation around doing outreach and follow-up. And when I asked her, like, why did you leave your cushy corporate job to become a consultant? She said, that, well, the real reason is my young kids. Like, I want to spend more time with them. And so we start to focus more on that. It's like every time you have hesitation around getting out there and doing your marketing or doing your follow-up, think about your kids and why you left your job to do what you're doing and use that as kind of the impetus or the thing that could help to push you forward. Is there anything that you found from a speaking or communication perspective that is like one of those keys? Yes. The first key that you mentioned, that notion that you are... It's almost like you're being selfish by holding it back if you don't market yourself. That's one of the really big keys to it. It's not, I'm not going out and begging for work. I am not going out and begging for attention. I have a thing that I know people want. They don't necessarily know how to find me though. So I'm going to take on the burden of them finding me by reaching out to them. While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently and so much more. And right now until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. 
This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. Doing the work as consultants or advisors and so forth, especially in those early stages, we're, we're taking on, like, I love how you said the word burden. It's almost like we're taking on the burden of doing the work for them. Like we're, our job is to make it easier for them, not harder for them. We know they have this problem. They might not know they have the problem. <laughs> Sometimes educating people about the problem is part of the work that you need to do, but we know this problem exists and we can make it better for them. They don't necessarily have the time or the wherewithal to do the work of digging. So I'm going to do that for them. And that I find really, really, really helps me continue to push out the content because it can be tiring. You create content. Anyone out there who's a content creator knows that that can be really tiring, but that is part of this. Hey, you need this help and I've got it. That's part of the marketing, part of the pull in. That is really what prevents it from going into that gross place of feeling like you're begging for work. Yeah. I want to encourage everyone joining us right now to to spend a bit of time just thinking about how this might apply to certain areas of your life and where you currently experiencing some hesitation or resistance and hold that something might might be holding you back from really achieving your true potential or or seeing greater success and think about how what we're talking about here today you might be able to apply to to see better results. So let's come back now and kind of I guess fast forward I should say to your time of starting your business. And you mentioned the first thing that you did really when you decided to kind of make that leap or test the waters in a more formal manner was to place an ad on a website called Kijiji, which is, as you said, very similar to Craigslist and more people would know about. That's very, like, I've rarely heard of a consultant doing that. So it's, I love it, right? It's, it's ingenious. It's so different. Tell me about that. Like who contacted you? Did you have random people contacting you? Like what was initial experience of posting on a, essentially a classified site and what did you post? I posted an ad saying, do you need help with your public speaking? I help people who are in business, who are looking at accelerating their careers using public speaking or who, or who need to give corporate presentations. So right on the get-go, I focused on the, this is for work. This is for corporate. I am not going to teach your high schooler how to solve their speaking problems because I, I don't want to work with high schoolers. I want to work with people who are already there. I put that out there and it was a very simple ad because I was still working my nine to five, had just bought a condo, was feeling broke and didn't want to spend any money on it. So it was like your basic little ad. And the person who found me, oddly enough, now that I'm uh, in a house, he lives like two blocks away. It's weird. He was starting up a startup actually, and he wanted to get better at pitching to potential investors. And he reached out and said, this is about right. Let's meet. If we hit it off, I'd love to work with you. And we did hit it off. And a couple of weeks after that, my second client called up and she is a mid-level management, or at least was at the time, is in upper level management now with investment products. And she said, I need to give these presentations. They have to be better. I don't know who to go with. I called someone in the States and they were outrageously expensive. What are your rates? <laughs> So I like raised my rates a little bit and then started working with her. So it was coming from all sectors. Like it was, and after that, it was someone in the medical field. Right. It so was are you saying that place. you had like two or three or more clients that actually came from that one little ad that you played? Yes. It still shocks me. Right. And how long did that go on for? How long did you continue running that ad? I kept that ad up for about five months. And then after I started working with those initial, the ad brought in four clients off the bat, three of them I am still in contact with, and they started referring me elsewhere. Right. Gotcha. Do you remember how much you spent on that ad over the five month period and how much you generated in revenue? I spent nothing and I generated about $5,000 in revenue. Okay. So it was a free ad placement. Okay. And you generated about $5,000 in revenue. So it's not a lot of money, but it's getting the business started. And you said from there, those clients start to refer you to to other people. To other people, to other clients, to associations that I could speak at. And every time I received one of those, because it was a referral, there was already a high amount of trust coming into this offering. One discovery call and I'd get another client signed on. Right. Let's now look at like your business today. So that's how you got things started. 
And it went from there, referrals, introductions to associations, speaking in different places, getting clients through those channels. If we look at today, 2022, what's working best for you over the last six to 12 months of lead generation, bringing clients and growing a pipeline of business? The best lead generation is giving great talks at other organizations. And this is something that you'll hear with many people who are in the speaking sphere is that the best marketing you can do for your next talk is knocking this talk out of the park because you are now effectively holding an audience captive for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes, where they have said, you are an expert. That's why you are the person that we've chosen to speak to us. And then you have all the time in the world to reinforce your expertise and give them a hell of a good experience. Those generate spin-off talks and spin-off training opportunities and one-on-one clients. So that has always kind of been my focus in terms of marketing activity has been to speak. So I do a select number of free talks every year, depending on the organization and if I see it as a good fit. But aside from that, it's focusing on making every talk I have for paid clients just fantastic, delivering a ton of value because I know that will generate more work. Yeah. I want to also dig into and and have you share some best practices around speaking and communication so that everyone listening can learn and, and, and hopefully find some areas to improve in. But before we do that, talk to me a little bit more about how your business model has evolved. So you started off doing relatively small engagements for clients, right? Totaling 5,000 or so dollars. What do things look like today? Like, I'd love to know the progression of, did you start offering different types of packages? What kind of price ranges? Maybe we could start with that. And then I have a few more questions about the how you actually approach speaking and monetizing the speaking itself. Absolutely. With those first few clients, I had no idea what to charge. None. My first client, I charged $30 an hour. My second client, I charged $80 an hour. I had no clue. But once I started figuring out more about the niche that I wanted to work with and saying, no, I want management and up, I began looking up what other management coaches were charging and got my fees in line with that, which was definitely a game changer. From there, I began offering public classes because I knew there was also a very good subset of people who might not be in those positions who would benefit more from a group class setting than a one-on-one and who couldn't afford my coaching fees. So the public group classes started up and they are still, well, not during the pandemic, obviously, but still a pretty good revenue generator. And I'm looking forward to being able to host them again. The corporate training and the speaking is the bread and butter, for sure. That's the bread and butter. And I got to a place where I could monetize that when I niched down on who it was, when I had a very clear identification of who it was I was speaking to and what specific communication topics I wanted to address, because it's a big thing out there. It's a really, really big topic. And I decided I deal only with speaking communication. I do not talk about writing. I do not talk about anything else, just speaking communication in face-to-face settings, especially in high stakes or high competition environments where you need to be able to persuade, you need to be be able to make a really good impression, and you might be dealing with people who also have big personalities and there's a lot of tension. Right. How did you arrive at that level of specialization and focus? Because a lot of people have, and I'm sure yourself too, have a lot of experiences, a pretty wide and broad skill set that you could apply. So you could help a lot of different people to do a lot of different things. How do you narrow in and say, this is exactly what I'm going to focus on and not be overly concerned about the potential in air quotes of business that you might leave on the table? Yeah. That practice of focusing down was a combination of paying really close attention to the audience's responses and how they liked my approach. I was not about to significantly alter my approach because someone might say, oh, well, it's a little harsh. It's a little aggressive. I'm very blunt when it comes to talking about communication psychology. And I paid attention to the audiences that responded to that. And I also paid attention to how they responded to me and how much I liked working with them. And that's when I realized that my approach fits this profile. Again, the high stakes, the no nonsense, but still care, people who still really care about what it is they want to do and are focused on putting in that work to achieve that speaking excellence. And that sucked it right down. So I don't typically speak. I used to be in libraries, but I don't speak to libraries because we just don't resonate. Finance, on the other hand, resonates very well (laughs) with this sort of thing. 
paying attention to those kinds of factors and then just saying, you know what? I didn't enjoy talking to that audience. I'm not going to do it again. I loved talking to them. I'm going to do it some more. And that kind of niche niched it down for me. It was also a process of paying attention to what those ideal audiences were asking me for. One of the topics I'd say my most popular topic alongside persuasion talks right now is executive presence. And I started speaking about that because one of my clients who deals with persuasion said, look, we've got a bunch of green upper level managers and they have to step it up. You've touched on this before. Can you create a whole training series about it? You bet I can. And that's now one of the most popular topics. So pay attention to what people are asking for. Yep. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into your kind of structure of monetizing your talks and your other services. A lot of people look at speaking right as a way to just generate leads. Some people look at speaking as a way to, to actually generate considerable amount of revenue. How do you currently do that? Like what percentage of, of your revenue comes from the actual speaking in front of an audience? And what percentage comes from the coaching or kind of consulting and advisory services that, and training that you provide to people that is not just the direct talk itself? Mm -hmm. By speaking, just to clarify, are you referring to things like keynote speaking or do you put training into that as well? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I'm, I'm glad that, you act, that you're making that distinction. When I'm referring to speaking, I'm really saying like you in front of a room or in front of a, a screen, you know, Zoom audience delivering a talk and it's more you giving the talk, not so much doing interactive training with people. It's about a third, a third, a third, a third one-on-one -on -one coaching consulting, a third, the training, the interactive style, and a third more of the direct talk keynote type, whether or not it's an actual keynote, but that style of delivery, it's very evenly balanced. And I would say that starting in about my third year of business, it always has been kind of that even balance of the buckets. As monetizing the speaking goes, I was really deliberate kind of from the get-go by saying that speaking activity is both marketing and revenue generation. And I have to be picky as to when it is one or the other. Now, every time speaking is revenue generation, it's also marketing. So I treat it with the same kind of intensity. But when I'm speaking for pure marketing, so this means speaking for free, I have to be very, very clear in terms of, is this the right audience? Is this an audience that has people in it who will pay me either for the individual, for the consulting or for the training or for the speaking? Can I expect this to generate revenue within a few months? And how many of these a year am I going to do? So I'm very picky. If someone approaches me and says, and I'm sure that other listeners have experienced this, it'll be great exposure. We have the perfect audience for you. My immediate answer is no, or I double my price because now I'm irritated. <laughs> and doing that is a way of me saying, no, darn it, you will not devalue me in that way. So that's very much a psychological process where I come out and say, ah, it's actually this much. But if I see a good potential, and I know going in that this is not going to be a paid opportunity, but it is such a good fit, then going in, I've already decided that I'm willing to do it for free. I never let other people convince me of that. So I might only do a few a year, but they tend to be very high revenue. Where I fussed with that recently was at the beginning of the pandemic, when I knew that a lot of my clients who I had spoken to live, done some online training for, were really going to be struggling with the virtual communication with their teams and had not yet come over to the side of, hey, virtual works really well. I contacted all of them. I spent about a month calling them up saying, hey, how's it going? How's the virtual? Yeah, not great, eh? I've got a webinar. I'll do it for your whole team for free. Feel free to invite every client you have. Hack the room because people need help. And that was a way of me getting ahead of the noise of the pandemic and getting people realizing, hey, wait a minute, this training can still happen. I love that you said you spent a month calling people because very often you hear someone say, yeah, and no, I sent emails. I didn't hear back. Why did you choose to call and not just email? I called clients that I already had a connection with because I had their numbers but I also called because I knew that people were spending 10 plus hours a day with nothing but their computer in front of them. And they were so sick of it and so frustrated and so lonely that to pick up a phone and listen to a voice that was not coming out of your computer would be like a breath of fresh air. So I really am a fan of understanding the best medium to reach out to people with. And I love 
virtual. It has been probably 50% of my business from the beginning has been virtual. I love it, but people were too saturated with it. I wanted them out of their email and off the Zoom camera on the phone. Right. Makes a lot of sense. That's why I called. Have you found that you have your three kind of different groupings of offers? Is there a typical starting point for a client? Like, do most of your clients tend to start with a talk, whether it's free or paid, and then come into training and then to come into coaching? Or is there some other starting point, or is it all just random in terms of how people, how how they enter your world? Roll the dice. Okay. Got you. All over the place. Some see me give a talk and want the one-on-one. Some get the one-on-one and say, come in and help my team. It is all over the place. And I should probably do better data collection to actually figure that out, but kind of taking an approach of- It's working. It's working. Um, It's coming. The other question I have for you is around the talks that you give, whether they're free or paid, but especially when you are delivering free talks, whether that is in-person or virtual- What is your approach to a call to action? How do you think about generating leads from those experiences, from those talks? Do you have a specific call to action during or or at the end of that presentation? Or do you just kind of hope that people will contact you? Or do you do anything to try and generate leads? Oh, you bet I do. You bet. Yeah. I do this with both my paid and my free talks. Actually, I follow kind of the same format with very few exceptions. I have handouts and that is the thing that I want them to have because I deliver a lot of info when I'm speaking and people are always worried that they're not going to be able to capture it all. So tell them, don't write anything down. I have got really extensive handouts for you. Put your name and your email address down on that piece of paper. So if I'm live, I have a, it's very analog. I have a little piece of paper about this big at every single seat. And that makes a big difference. And it says, yes, I would like to hear more. Name, email address, and then four boxes. The first box is for handouts. The second box is for newsletter. Then I'm interested in coaching and I'd like Lauren to come in and speak for my team or at my event. Take off the boxes and I will reply to you. I do not ask them to contact me because the instant they leave that room, they're thinking about something else. They'll likely forget. So I want that ball to be in my court. That increased my follow-up business by, oh my gosh, it doubled it easily when I started following How, how, how do you format. collect those pieces of paper? How do I select them? No, I like, how do you collect them? Do you yourself walk up and down the aisles and, and collect them? Do you have somebody do that for you? I get people to help me do it. And it's, that's easy. You just ask the event organizer or you bring in a, a voluntolder or someone. You can always find people to help you collect the papers at the end. I've never had a problem with that. And if I'm online, that one took a little bit of finagling because people don't go to the thing when they're online. They don't follow up. So I still tied it to the handouts. And what I have now is if you want the handouts, go to this website and I send that out in a follow-up email as well. Go to this website, name, email address, and then they're on my list. And I put out content usually every two to three weeks. So there's that constant steady drip reminder of high value content. Every talk I do, I do those, those, one of those things. Right. That's really interesting. There, I haven't used this, so don't quote me on it, but there may be some uh, new Zoom kind of applications or apps that would allow you to actually, people on the screen to just click a button, like to select those things. So maybe something to take a look at that, that could help with, with that. They've just been rolling that, that kind of stuff out more recently I've been hearing. So that's pretty cool. And I do have, because I know people are saying, oh, that sounds like a lot of work, especially with the papers. I know that many people will use the QR codes, do the QR code, the phone thing. This is a barrier. A pen, on the other hand, takes less time and less effort. For many people, it's a lot faster for them to write it out. The other thing with the piece of paper in front of every seat is that thing is staring at them the whole time. And they'll sign up out of curiosity to get those handouts. It has been no question to me in live formats, what is the better conversion? And it's paper. I have a few more questions before we wrap up. One is, I don't want to leave people hanging. I mentioned that I'd try and get a few best practices from you around executive presence or speaking and communication, especially for the consultant, for the advisor, working with typically senior level leaders. What have you seen is maybe the most common mistake that people make or the biggest area for improvement? And if you could just identify what one or two of those are and then offer kind of best practices to improve upon them. 
two big areas for improvement. The first one is that they aren't certain what their core message or proposition actually is. So they will come when a question gets asked them or they're asked to say, what do you do? What do you have to offer me? They present the kitchen sink. That is too much for people to take in with any meeting or any presentation. I want people to focus on the one thing. And I mean, one sentence that you want people to remember if they remember nothing else. That sentence must be declarative. It is a position statement. It is a clear declaration of something that you know or that you have. And the idea there isn't that they have to remember everything you said. It's that they remember just enough to look up the next piece of information if they forget everything else. So you need your thesis statement. That's what it is, is a thesis statement. And that's going to form the backbone of your presentation and kind of give you a North Star for any sort of meetings or client conversations that you might have. The second piece, and I know this is pretty rich coming from someone who speaks for a living, is that they talk too much. And one of my favorite approaches is when I'm, when I'm having conversations with people, when I'm in client discussions, is I want them to do the talking as quickly as possible. Tell me about yourself. What's going on with this in your life right now? What's keeping you up at night about it? Dig into their problems and get them to do the talking. You want to demonstrate that you are interested in them, that you're deeply interested, and that you're listening to what they have to say. That makes them feel good, makes them feel important, but it also allows you on the fly to quickly adjust your message so it's fine-tuned for where their head is at right now. My version for doing that when you're in front of a big group, when you're giving a one-way talk, so a keynote or a webinar or whatever, is to have a question that people can respond to either in the chat box, a poll, or by raising their hands. If you're live, do the raise your hand type question and then respond to them. Oh, 50% of the room says this, really? Well, some of you must be lying because I know that stats show that blah, blah, blah. And then people laugh and there's this back and forth. There's this sense of back and forth. Same thing online. Get them to answer a question and then respond to their answers so that they feel like it's a conversation and not that you're talking at them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. You have a lot going on, right? You have the three different areas of of your business, public courses that you've been doing, content that, that you're creating. When you think, Lauren, about... What has contributed most to the success that you have today in business or to the level of performance and productivity that you're able to maintain? What would you say? Like, what's the secret sauce or, and it doesn't have to be one thing, but is there something or a couple of things that you just do on a regular basis that you find is incredibly important for you? It's like a habit that helps you to achieve the success that you've seen. I'm always developing new stuff. And there's a couple reasons for that. One of them is that when I am saying what's next, what I'm doing is keeping my brain responsive to my audience needs, not assuming that just because these communication issues have been communication issues since the days of Aristotle, that I'd never have to change what I do or that people don't look at it differently. It keeps me engaged in my own content. So that keeps my own spirits up and it ensures that I've got that steady drip of stuff coming out to the world. I do not post stuff every week. I don't always have new videos on my website, but once or twice a month, for sure I do. And constantly creating and refining that content is what enables me to maintain and grow my mastery in this topic, because ultimately that's what people are buying. That's what they need to see. And that's what they want to get. So that's a way of me ensuring that, yep, you're getting the latest, you're getting the best, And you're seeing it on a regular basis. Right. How do you balance or how do you approach working on your business? So let's say developing this new content or doing your marketing. I know to to a degree, your marketing is done through the speaking or talks that you give, but relating to this idea of always creating new new content or, or new material, how do you ensure that you have the time to do that when you're also busy delivering on client projects. Anything you found out that works best for you there? What works best for me, and I know this will be contrary to what some other people do, but some might say, right, this is up my alley, is I do focused sprints of a given type of work. So when I am in deep, like I've got a pile of talks lined up because speaking tends to be very seasonal. When it is speaking season, I drop all other activity. I often do not post on social media. I disappear off the face of the earth for creating new videos or whatever. I am in deep on my core speaking content. Once that lightens up, I move back and focus solely on marketing 
or solely on book development. Whatever big project I have, that's the only one I work on at that time, which does mean that I have to chamber up a ton of content. So I'm going to be recording videos soon. That'll be all I do for several weeks, recording, editing, and scheduling videos. But I find that if I don't do that deep focus on a single topic, it's too scattershot. If I try to do three different things in a day, one of them gets halfway done. So it's February is is tax and video month. June is book development month. December is whatever. You know, I I've learned what those patterns in my business are. And I devote myself very strongly to one or two things at a time. Right. Makes sense. Two more questions and then we're gonna wrap up. In the last six to twelve months, what book have you read or listened to that could be fiction or nonfiction, but a sign you've found just either inspirational, motivational, incredibly helpful, enjoyable to read. I'm a big Seth Godin fangirl. I will not hide that. And the best book that I've read lately was is his latest, which is The Practice. And that one resonated because it really hit home in terms of feeling the grind and often the isolation that this kind of work can create. We, many speakers and many consultants feel the same way, like we're working in a vacuum. And getting into the practice, he addresses a lot of the emotions behind doing this kind of work. It's not a competency thing. It's that we need to be able to wrestle with the emotions of doing this kind of hard work. And it was a book that was both very gentle in dealing with these issues, but also very straightforward and uncompromising. You want to do that awesome thing, you have to do all the crappy things that lead up to it. But do you really want that awesome thing? Maybe it looks different. So it was a wonderful book. Good philosophy, good, solid business philosophy. Yeah. Seth always has really great, inspirational, thoughtful content, uh, including all of his books. So he always delivers great great recommendation. Just to wrap up, I want to first of all say thank you for coming on. Really enjoyed uh, speaking today. And I think others will have gotten a lot from the conversation. So thank you for that, Lauren. But also, where can people go to learn more about your book, Unmute, and and also just learn more about you and your work? Absolutely. To learn more about me and my work, head to my website, laurensergi.com, spelled the same way my name is spelled because it is my name. In terms of my book, I will flash it because I said I was a Seth Godin fangirl. And he wrote the blurb on the front cover for my book. So that was just my moment in the pandemic. My God, Seth Godin wrote a testimonial. The book you can get at any major online book retailer. It's everywhere online, or you can head to unmutebook.com. And to cast back to something that you were asking earlier in terms of where do you generate, how do you generate topics, where do you get ideas? And mine has always been very responsive. I wrote this in direct response to my clients over the pandemic saying, my teams don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It's not getting easier. I am so frustrated with this medium. That's how this book came about. Listen to what people need because they will tell you. Yeah. Fantastic advice, Lauren. Thank you again so much. We'll have all that linked up in the show notes at consultingsuccess.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for coming on, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com. 